Several months ago, I found myself and another special operator, we'll call him Jeff to keep his name out of the public, standing on a commodities dock off the coast of Haiti. This port was rumored to be part of a human trafficking route that would go from Haiti to Cuba. We were looking for a little boy. He was taken, he was kidnapped from a church. And his name was Gardy. It was the son of the minister. On this dock, if we could possibly get on one of these ships that were heading from the east side of the island to the west side of the island, we could have a conversation with some of the, the deckhands and possibly get some information as to the whereabouts of this little boy. But it was chaos. They were moving goods on and off the ship, and getting the time to talk to the captain was not easy. So Jeff went forward and talked to the captain. They had a little bit of an arguing match, but through some negotiations, we were on the ship and we were headed west. There was another passenger on the ship. It was a woman. She was hysterical. She was crying hysterically. She was afraid of the water. She couldn't swim and she feared her for her life. I'm not sure why she was on the ship using this mode of transportation, but she was on there. And she was crying. And um, it was crazy. And I, I thought, we're going to have quite a trip ahead of us. Our trip was going to be 10 hours long on this ship. And the first two hours... Deckhands were arguing and fighting with the captain, accusing him of overloading the ship with these bags of cement, causing the waves to crash over the side of the ship, which was damaging or potentially endangering this precious cargo. If this precious cargo were damaged, their daily wages would be lost. They would not receive any money, which was only about a dollar a day. So this continued. And a fight broke out between two of the deckhands, a fist fight. And fortunately, the fist fight got broken up because the ship started to sink. It was taking on water, and because the, si the ship was sitting too low in the water, and the water was coming in through the slats on the wood. So two of the deckhands were up front, bailing water out of the ship. Two deckhands were in the back, bailing water out of the back of the ship. And one of the deckhands was taking cotton and a knife and a conch shell and cramming cotton into the cracks of the wood to stop the water from coming in. Now, fortunately, the hysterical woman, she was calm at this point, but she was now throwing up. And she was, she was too scared to lean over the side of the ship and throw up, so she was throwing up inside the ship on my shoes. Now, I have a pretty high threshold and tolerance for fear, but my threshold of tolerance for the smell of throw up and sound of somebody throwing up and seeing it was very little. So I needed to make my way from the front of the ship to the back of the ship. When I turned around, Jeff was leaning over the side of the ship puking. Now, we had not had food and very little water for the past 24 hours because we had been up in the mountains of Haiti. And our food drop had not made it to us because they couldn't get a four-wheel drive vehicle up into the mountains to us. So we, had, we were going without food. I think he was suffering from a little bit of dehydration. This continued for about six hours. And then we got news. The captain of the ship got a phone call on his cell phone. There's a storm brewing ahead. And he turned to all the passengers and he said, he announced to the ship, all the passengers have to abandon ship. And I thought, what? Abandon ship? I hadn't seen a village for probably three hours on the side of the, on the, on the island. I'm not sure if he was planning for us to swim to the, to the island and then walk to civilization. But fortunately, about 30 minutes later, we saw a village up ahead. And that same conch shell that served as a hammer was now a foghorn. As he blew it, he called to the shore to get someone to send a dinghy out to rescue us on, uh, on this island, or I'm sorry, on this ship, pull us off the ship and take us to land. Now, the woman was hysterical again. So they loaded her, more pushed her onto the dinghy to get her to shore. As we were heading to shore, as soon as the ship touched just a grain of sand, this woman came barreling down the ship over the top of myself and Jeff and onto the land. Now, Jeff and I got on the ground 
sitting on the beach. I turned over to him, look at, looked at him after all of this chaos had sort of subsided. And he had blood running down the side of his face. And the woman, as she went through, her fingernail took a gash out of the side of his head. So it was crazy. And I, I looked at myself, I looked at him, and I thought to myself, what in the world is going on? Where, where am I? What is happening? I'm not a Navy SEAL. I'm not highly trained. I'm a director. And I thought, what in the world? And how did I get here? Well, it was a long journey. It was a three-year journey. It started three years ago. My partner, Darren Fletcher, who I direct films with, he and I were directing a movie. And this movie, we needed a historical consultant. We needed an expert, an expert on the Civil War and the Revolutionary War in America. We found him. His name was Tim Ballard. And he was the expert that we needed. We met with him. We brought him on as a consultant to the film. He told us all the stories that we needed. We heard all the stories. He was perfect. But then he started to tell us other stories. He started to tell us stories about him rescuing children from being sex trafficked. And we thought, who is this guy? I mean, this is the story we should be telling. Fletch and I looked at each other and we said, this is, the, this is a great story. That's what we should be telling. But who is this guy sitting next to us? Well, he was a special agent for Homeland Security and former, formerly in the CIA. So he began to educate us on the problems, Fletch and I, of trafficking, sex trafficking in the world. Human trafficking is the fastest growing international crime. It, that includes anyone that's being trafficked for sex and or labor. Trafficking is the third most lucrative crime in the world, second only to drugs and weapons. There are an estimated 35 million people trapped in modern slavery today. That is more, more slaves today than during the entire transatlantic slave trade. And of those 35.8 million people, there are nearly 2 million children that are being held against their will as sex slaves. So this is unacceptable. It's a huge problem. And it, what does one do about it? What can one do with, about this problem? We're only average citizens, right? So what can we do? Well, we get involved. We get involved because once we have the burden of the knowledge of what's going on out there, we can't turn a blind eye to the situation. Now, there are lots of qualified individuals out there. There are some amazing organizations that are doing incredible things. But Fletch and I, we now knew about this problem, and we were doing nothing about it, which was unacceptable. So, Tim Ballard, he left the government and started his own organization. He started an organization called Operation Underground Railroad, which freed him up to be a little more active in being able to rescue children. So as for us, we took Tim's historical background to influence what we were going to do to make a difference. Our goal would be to repeat history. Slavery in the 1800s was abolished through entertainment. Now I know that sounds crazy, but Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. And that book sold 19 million copies sold 19 million copies and started such an awareness in the north of what was going on in the south with slavery that it started a war. Now, as legend goes, when Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, he said to her, and I quote, so you're the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. Well, that was our goal. We were going to use entertainment to start a war against this modern form of slavery. We decided to make a movie, but we didn't have any money. Fortunately to us, a family came forward, the Udy family, a family that we will be forever thankful for. In 24 hours, they came up with the money and financed the film. Never happens in Hollywood. So we set off to make the documentary. We strapped on hidden cameras, went undercover, started meeting with these traffickers with this organization, Operation Underground Railroad. This film, would document these operations and would be, bring an awareness to this great problem. 
Our first operation was in Cartagena, Colombia. We worked with the local governments. We worked hand in hand with them, and we would comb the beaches by day, and at night we would go through the streets. We found 11 girls that were being trafficked and found three traffickers. But at the last minute, the operation had to be called off. It was a failure. We were devastated. All the time and effort we had put in, staying up all night, was gone. And we had to watch those girls go back into the darkness from which they came, from being right within our grasp, only 100 yards. We went from Colombia to Haiti. Now, this was the first time we had been to Haiti, and we were looking for that kidnapped boy. On every operation, I buy a painting from the country where I'm at. And, uh, and on the back of that painting, I write my journals. And so I wanted to read something, just a small piece of the journal when we were there in Haiti. And it says, On Sunday, we went to the church where Gardy was taken from. We started asking questions to see what they knew about what had happened the day he was kidnapped. We got a few leads, an orphanage that sells kids on the black market. But in the end, all the interviews left us on a bit of a downer because our best interview was with a guy that was convinced that Gardy was no longer alive. When we heard that, all our hearts sank. He was pretty convincing with his information, but we weren't going to let that get us down and lose hope. We followed that intel to that orphanage and found that it was, they were selling kids. We bought two kids for $20,000. And we shut it down, and we were able to liberate those kids, 27 of them, from the terrible conditions that they were living in. We didn't find Gardy there, but we weren't going to give up. We went back to Columbia, where we found the 11 girls that we had found the first time, got them back, along with quite a few more. Now, with three operations in two countries in the can, so as we say in, the, in Hollywood, we had the content to the film. We had more than we needed. We had about 3,000 hours of footage. The first cut of the movie was 12 hours long. It was almost an insurmountable task to get this down to a movie. Yet, from all the footage, we created the film, The Abolitionists. It's been rewarding to watch the impact, the overall impact that, this, that, that we've had even before people started to see the film. During the making of this film, 57 children were rescued and seven traffickers have been put in prison. If that was all that we had accomplished, that would have been great. But fortunately, we were able to accomplish, we've been able to accomplish much more. We've been able to see and go on with Operation Underground Railroad 25 additional operations. And in those operations, we've been able to rescue more than 300 children and put in jail over 120 traffickers. So we've also taken the footage. When we're out undercover, we film these guys. We film the meetings, we, everything. This footage, we turn over to the authorities, and it serves as evidence. And that evidence is used by the prosecutors so that these girls, these poor girls, don't have to be traumatized again and stand on the stand and testify against those captors that had traumatized them in the past. When that happens, usually they, they freeze up and they don't testify and these guys go free. So that was no longer happening. The film is qualified to be up for an Oscar. Now, it's not nominated yet. We've got a mountain to climb there, but we're willing to climb it. We're building a video game called Teddy Bear Heroes, a game that will allow the entry into this problem in a much softer way. For those that the topic is too hard, they can now, they'll now be able to collaborate and be a part of the cause and be a part of the movement. The film is out now. It's creating some movement. It's firing people up. It's doing what we want it to do. And from all those operations, the additional operations that we've been on, we've, we're cutting a television series creating episodes so that we can continue to put this out there, to continue to bring the awareness of this problem. Through entertainment, we hope to change the hearts and mind of everyday people. 
if every citizen in the world out there would stand up and say, enough is enough, this battle could be won. In the 1800s, it was the everyday citizen that would hang a lantern in their window to help free the slaves through the Underground Railroad. It was through those small, small acts of everyday individuals that freed an estimated 100,000 slaves. Imagine what we can do today with the technology that we have. Imagine the effect and the amount of people and children that we could free. So in closing, I feel that I need to give a warning. I want to caution you all of one thing. Entertainment and technology are the solution to this problem. But it's also the problem. It's through the internet that destructive devices are used to lure individuals in. Pornography is often the gateway into this dark world. Please be aware of what your children are looking at. Be aware of their activity. Social media is grabbing our youth at a younger and younger age. Be aware of what our children are doing on the internet and who their friends are. It's so easy for a 50-year-old to guise behind a 16-year-old profile, and then by the time your child finds out that that person is not who he said he was, it's too late. They're gone, and it's near impossible to get them back. We would never take a pocket knife, an open pocket knife, and give it to a two-year-old child, would we? We would wait until that child is ready to be able to use that knife, and then we would stand by their side teach them, talk to them, tell them how to use it, watch them as they use it. We would set up guidelines. We would set up parameters for which they can use this pocket knife, right? The internet is exactly the same. Technology, phones, gadgets, they're no different. We have to be careful. Please be cautious. And I know well the preteen and the teenager pressure out there. I've got four kids of my own, and I have heard all the pleadings and promises that they'll do if they can just get this one device and have full access. I've heard it all. My daughter waged a three-year campaign on me to get a phone from the ages of 11 to 13, nonstop. And in her freshman year, she had the perfect, perfect case. She came home from school. Tears flowing down her face. She said, Dad, I almost died because I didn't have a phone. And I thought, okay, well, this is pretty traumatic. So I was listening to her. I was comforting her. And, and so I said, okay, well, I'm listening. And she continued to tell me, he says, you were late picking me up for school today, and I had to cross the crosswalk. And when I was crossing the crosswalk, a car almost hit me, Dad. So I, I, I listened to her, and I said, Okay, all right, I comfort her. A few months passed and Christmas came. So it was time for me to give her a gift. Now in our family, I give one gift to my kids. And that gift has been coined as the crazy daddy present. And, and this present that I gave her, it was the perfect present. She would no longer ever, she could never come to me and say that she could no longer be seen. Because she could wear this to school, if I can get it on. She's a little smaller than I am. She could wear this to school and she could walk around. She could cross the crosswalk and she would never be, she would never be hit by a car, right? This was the perfect gift. She could wear this. She would be protected, right? Now, I'm not that heartless. I did get her a phone that year. But I got her a phone that could not text pictures, I got a, I did, we deactivated the internet so she couldn't get it. She didn't get a smartphone until she went to college. So she got a phone. I'm not, I'm not that heartless. Now let me get out of this suit before I fall down. But it are, it's these tools that, if we're not careful, are the ones that take away the innocence of our children. They're the ones that replenish the two million children that are out there being taken. We have to focus and bring our children home. We have to stop the supply.
And for those that are creating the demand, we have to make it so hard for them, fear to come into that space. It's too risky. These kids here are all Haitian, but it's happening to children all across the world. It's happening in your backyard, it's happening in my backyard. This is the beginning of the fight, the beginning of a great movement. Be a part of it. It's not easy, but it's worth it. Be one of those average citizens that holds the lantern up in the window. Become an abolitionist. Thank you.